Welcome to CVPR 622 Perfusion Techniques 2 and today we are going to be discussing cerebral perfusion during deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. So by way of introduction um, let's talk about the uses of hypothermia with cardiopulmonary bypass and and certainly over the last couple decades the trend has been towards normal thermic or mild hypothermia for your standard adult cases. Um, back when I first started perfusion we'd often almost routinely go on bypass and cool to 28 degrees uh, but that's been largely abandoned for more mild hypothermia or even normothermic uh, CPB for cases and there's a number of reasons for that it's uh, there's uh, less uh, changes in the coagulation profile of the patients. Uh, they just seem to do better if you can keep them warmer. But there is still a smaller subset of patients that really need uh, deep or moderate or deep hypothermia and that may be with or without TCA, or total circulatory arrest. And these, these subsets are the neonatal heart patients, especially the uh, uh, total anomalous pulmonary return, TAPVR, um, aortic arch reconstructions in the adults, and uh, even some neurosurgical procedures where they need to decompress the uh, vasculature in the brain. They may use a deep hypothermia. Hypothermia is good. Cold is a perfusionist's best friend. Uh, next semester when we go into some of our crisis management, Cooling the patient down is one of the first lines of defense. Um, and physiologically, it reduces metabolism. And when we can reduce the metabolism to a lower level, it gives us technically a safety, uh, a greater safety margin for those emergency situations. But let's talk about hypothermia in medicine in general. Uh, it's not a normal state physiologically for us. Um, we're warm-blooded animals, uh, so hypothermia is a, uh, we're automatically inducing a non-physiologic state. Uh, but the idea of using it in medicine really goes way back to 1797. Dr. James Curry, a Scottish surgeon, um, astounded the Royal College of Surgeons in London with his report on using cold to lower body temperature. And he would put uh, someone undoubtedly with a fever into a big barrel of brine water and he'd cool them down and he had the lowest recorded temperatures of 94 degrees which is uh, significantly colder than than normal and then we entered a more physiologic era of uh, hypothermia uh, where uh, to, to the modern date of 1940, which is sort of the modern era of, of hypothermia. A lot of things were going on uh, right around 1940 in regards to using hypothermia in medicine and in surgery especially. So, of course, we know that the first open heart surgery done success successfully with a heart-lung machine was by Dr. James Gibbon, pictured here. And... Uh, the strategy at this time was cardio maintain normal physiology, normal flow rates, normal oxygenations, and normal temperatures. Um, that was a very distinct uh, preference in the early going. If we're going to mechanically support the heart and lungs, let's keep everything else as normal as possible. Competing with that was another line of study at the same time, and that said, uh, you know, we can do heart surgery with just hypothermia and no stinking cardiopulmonary bypass machine. We can cool patients down, and we can inflow occlude, the vena cava, um, and open the heart, and we will buy enough time to correct the, uh, correct the, the cardiac anomaly and uh, and warm the patients back up. And this really came out of some some interesting study uh, out of uh, the the great Canadian physician Dr. W.G. Bigelow and um, he said this as probably as a result of uh, previous research on frostbite I woke up one night with a simple solution 
cool the whole body, hypothermia, reduce the oxygen requirements, stop the circulation through the heart, and open the heart. And in 1950, they reported a series of successful open heart procedures in animals using that technique. They could literally cool down dogs, open their hearts, close their hearts, and recover them. And so that was an exciting moment. Uh, they could buy the buy enough time to start stop recirculate stop circulation to the to the tissues. The tissues would be metabolically suppressed enough to where they could uh, have enough time to fix some of the problems in the heart. And so, actually, John Lewis preceded Gibbons' first uh, successful closure of an ASD. Uh, he closed in 1952, almost a year before Gibbon. He, he closed a secundum ASD in a five-year-old girl under direct vision using hypothermia and no cardiopulmonary bypass. Actually published a, a series on ASD closures with a 12% mortality rate. Now 12% today would for an ASD would be absolutely horrifying if you had a mortality rate with this group. But remember, up to that time, uh, the mortality rate for an ASD closure was 30% for some of the blind techniques that they were using, where they would they would go in and just quickly close uh, without even good visualization. So how did they do this technique? Well, they used um, surface cooling by immersion. And so there was these hypothermic tanks that were developed. And what they would do is place patients right inside those. And, they, and the idea was to cool them from the outside in. So you're putting a patient in a vat of ice water, literally, and cooling them down. And this is what it would have looked like in the operating room. Here's our patient anesthetized, paralyzed, and in a, and in a, in a water cooler of ice. And you can see there's the anesthetist. You've got your PAs and nurses. And here's probably the anesthesia fellow holding the thermometer, monitoring blood temperatures. And so heart surgery was done this way, no bypass, just cooling the patients. And it quick, we quickly began to see at that time the limitations of this techniques. Um, sure, there were benefits with inflow occlusion. Where they were obvious over the blind uh, warm techniques. However, really we could do ASDs, maybe some isolated aortic or pulmonic stenosis uh, cases, uh, but complex pathologies were uniformly failures using this technique, just that external uh, cooling technique. Now, let's pause for a second because um, there was some disturbing information came to me. I have eyes and ears everywhere, and I think uh, one of our alumni found this, that uh, actually that there was some unauthorized uh, student experimentation in hypothermia that occurred with the class of 2020. And this, this next image is fairly disturbing, uh, but I, I need to bring it to your attention because um, this is just dangerous uh, to do. Um, yeah, I, I have no words, uh, but uh, here one of, uh, one of your classmates is diving into uh, an icy pond. Um, another one of your classmates is on deck, and these students here on the side, they're every bit to blame because they didn't stop this, uh, this travesty from occurring. So um, let's buckle down. No more uh, unauthorized experimentation using some of the old 1950s technique of surface cooling. It's, it doesn't work out well. Anyways, cardiopulmonary bypass plus hypothermia was a match made in heaven. The assumption was uh, the, the assumption that full physiologic cardiopulmonary bypass uh, was questioned, and, that, and in 1958, down at Duke, uh, Dr. Seeley incorporated a modified General Motors radiator into the extracorporeal circuit. Incredible! He published he published the technique in the Annals of Surgery in 1958, um, where he, he put together uh, put a heat exchanger in the circuit so that it could be cooled and warmed. And so now the idea was extracorporeal blood cooling, where you could cool from the inside out. Cool the blood, 
which will then in turn cool the tissues. And this, this, this caught on very quickly. In fact, here's some old clippings in 1959 and 1961 maybe, um, right here in the, the Post Standard in Syracuse. Experts, uh, well, let me look at this one. Woman survives deep freeze heart surgery. And so that, that's, uh, it was uh, very sensationalized um, where they cooled a patient way down. And this is at St. Joe's Hospital. Um, and uh, the, surgery la the surgery procedure lasted six hours. And after doctors opened her aorta and took, it took them only two minutes and 15 seconds to split the tightened leaflets of the aortic valve and then cut through the right side of the heart to reach the mitral valve and enlarge its opening. So pretty incredible stuff at the time. Um, and still, when, we, when, I, when I'm in on a case where we use deep hypothermic circulatory rest, I, I still marvel uh, at what we're doing uh, in, in those moments where the patient is cold, bloodless, and with no, none of the indices uh, that would indicate life. Uh, and then after 20, 30 minutes, we can begin reperfusing and uh, pull them out of that suspended animation. So hypothermia and bypass uh, caught on, and just to review some of the effects, and I won't belabor this too much, I know you've had much of this, um, but the effects of hypothermia uh, are basically threefold. Uh, it, it does change biochemical reactions and metabolism, it does change the blood viscosity, and it does make changes in blood gases that we have to be aware of. Starting with one, uh, the, the metabolic rate, again, we, that's the whole point of cooling in so many ways is to reduce the metabolic rate. The same reason we have refrigerators to slow down metabolic processes so food will not spoil uh, due to uh, higher me metabolic rates of uh, deterioration. So um, you can see as you go from 40 degrees to 20 degrees, how much uh, the whole body oxygen consumption decreases. This is a common graft uh, in back in the days and it shows that you can actually uh, reduce cardiac indexes to meet oxygen consumption needs during hypothermia. And so the idea is that um, we can reduce flow, maybe even stop flow for, for periods of time of circulatory rest that, that will permit us to do so much more with, uh, for the surgeons. Q12, the multiple by which reaction rates change for every 10 degrees. You know, again, that idea uh, is uh, that for every 10 degrees that, uh, that we go down in temperature, the change in metabolic rate here is, is two and a half times, going from 35 degrees to 25 degrees. Now, this is a very common graph in our profession. Uh, I, I hope you've seen this one before. But this is a, the probability of safe total circulatory rest. Probability of safe. You know, really, safe total circulatory rest does not exist. Uh, but this is the probability of safe. And you can see at 37 degrees, boy, it's, it's what you've heard. You know, you can stop the flow to your brain for three minutes before uh, you're going to have neurological problems. If you cool to 28 degrees, you know, you've stretched that out to 15 minutes. But at 18 degrees, it doesn't start falling until out here um, greater than 30, 40, 40 minutes of circulatory rest. So again, the lodestone of uh, hypothermia is its metabolic suppression, and it uh, reduces metabolic rate, and that, reduce, that uh, facilitates a number of things. Uh, lower, lower no flow, that would reduce blood trauma. Um, blood is not coming in contact to our circuit as much. Um, it, and it provides the perfusionist a safety buffer. If there is an incident or an accident, uh, any perfusion uh, deficits, um, we, can, we can address. Levels of hypothermia, mild, moderate, deep, and profound. Um, again, that's when we say deep hypothermic circulatory rest, this is what we're talking about. And normally it's, it's the 18 degrees um, is where we're heading. Uh, but these are the categories of the levels of hypothermia. The effects of hypothermia on blood viscosity. As, uh, as, hypo as, as you become colder, 
there's an increase in blood viscosity. And actually, viscosity of blood increases about 2% per degree Celsius, which is, which is quite a lot. Um, you know, again, uh, the hematocrit is the biggest uh, contributor to our blood's viscosity. As the hematocrit goes up, viscosity goes up. And this caused, um, this caused the idea that, man, wait, maybe, we should, maybe we should hemodilute the patient uh, when we cool. And uh, that made sense because at the time, uh, because as you cool, as you cool, viscosity goes up. But if you hemodilute and reduce the hematocrit, viscosity goes down. So you kind of counteract that effect. And the old, the old dogma was hematocrit equals temperature. So if you cool to 18, your crit should be 18. Now that's that's largely fallen away, but the idea was that if your blood is so thick, um, you don't get as good microcirculatory circulation because of this term we magically we call sludging. Uh, it's ill-defined, but it's uh, you know it's uh, descriptive uh, that if the if the blood becomes as thick as peanut butter, it just does not perfuse the microcirculation as well. And so the idea is is if at a crit of 40 you've got a uh, viscosity of 1. Uh, at 22, to have a visco similar viscosity, you'd need to be at a hematocrit of 20. Still used in many places. We still accept uh, hemodilution uh, to, a, to a degree uh, in, in pediatrics and in adults. The newer concepts are, though, to, uh, to maintain uh, to maintain higher crits. In pediatrics, we, we don't see the crits going as low as we once did, and even in the circulatory arrest cases. So let's talk about some of the, uh, some of the issues we have to pay attention to when we cool. Um, again, our venous cannula is connected to a venous reservoir. Um, it's pulled out of the venous reservoir through a pump. We flow through a heat exchanger, an oxygenator, turning blue blood red through an arterial line filter, and then back into the aorta. Um, then, then we've got a heater cooler attached with a water bath that's circulating water at a certain temperature through our heat exchanger. Um, so let's set up a few other temperatures. Let's say this is patient is at 37 degrees and the venous blood coming down therefore is at 37 degrees and it's going to pass through our heat exchanger which here is set at 29 degrees and that's going to lower the temperature of the blood which is now 33 degrees. That's going to come back into the patient whose core temperature was at 37. And so this arterialized blood is going to hit um, the uh, capillary beds at 33. They're still at 37, lagging behind a little bit. So there's a gradient right here. There's a temperature gradient between the arterial blood and the patient, um, which is important to understand when we are um, when we're cooling. Then as we warm, there's also the other temperature gradient is between the venous blood and the heat exchanger. So this, this gradient here also is important, more important when we begin warming the temperature. Because if you have cold blood hitting a very warm heat exchanger, then, um, then gas can come out of solution. Warm blood hitting a colder temperature um, may not be as big a problem, but if we have cold blood hitting a warm patient, then uh, that, that's where we have to worry about it during cooling. This gradient right here during warming, the, the difference there. So some of the strategies, cooling and warming don't exceed 10 degrees during cooling be between the perfusate and the core temp, during warming between the venous blood and the heater, cooler water bath, and rewarming, careful rewarming protocols are important. Uh, we should warm gradually, and our max temperature on the inflow shouldn't be above 37.5. And again, the, the third aspect of hypothermia is changes in, in blood gases. And again, it's going to cause, uh, as you cool, you have uh, a greater affinity between oxygen and hemoglobin, a left shift in the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. Um, we also... Um, can consider hyperoxia. We'll talk about that again um, in, a, in a separate discussion, but uh, you can actually dissolve as much oxygen, hyperoxia 
follows the hypothesis that dissolved oxygen becomes more important as, you're, as you become uh, deeply hypothermic. And then changes in the solubility of oxygen and CO2. As temperatures go down, gases become more soluble in liquid. And as temperatures go down, more gas will be dissolved in plasma and the partial pressure will drop. And that's much more significant with CO2. And because of CO2's interrelationship with pH, that has a profound effect. And that's the alpha stat, uh, pH stat um, hypothesis. Um, and we'll look at both of those again in the next uh, screencast. So we, what we really want to do is talk about some of the neuroprotective strategies uh, when we use deep hypothermia. And, and of course, deep hypothermia is a neuroprotective strategy in and of itself because of the metabolic suppression. Um, Along with that, uh, it's always best to avoid any, uh, you know, minimize the length of circulatory arrest. Um, if you do have to use circulatory arrest, then um, consideration of cerebral perfusion, either retrograde or antegrade, would come into play. So we use deep hypothermic circulatory arrest in neonatal heart surgeries, especially with some single ventricles or TAPVRs and in aortic surgery, especially in the adults and aortic reconstruction. It's very exciting. It's almost a subspecialty in itself because of some of the interesting techniques that are used. But um, so any, anywhere, any, any, you know, it's used commonly uh, in elective complex aortic arch surgeries where it's impossible to freeze the brain through the cerebral vessels using CPV. So any surgeries that require low flow or the cessation of flow altogether, total circulatory arrest, would be a candidate for deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. Um, there's other there's other types of uh, you know aortic arch reconstruction is uh, the biggie I think in adults, but there's other ones in the adults: um, congenital aortic arch surgery, um, heavily um, aortic atherothrombosis, uh, uh, you know where. Where cross clamp, where you can't cross clamp, they may elect to cool a patient down. Um, pulmonary thromboendotarterectomies um, and some of the repairs of thoracoabdominal aneurysms. Uh, some of those elephant trunk procedures, where the whole descending aorta all the way down to the bifurcation uh, at the femorals is is done. Uh, some of the venal vena cava surgeries. Uh, there's uh, tumors invading into the vena cava and renal tumors. Some of these can be some of those surgeries can be facilitated using deep hypothermic circulatory rest. And then again, the neurovascular surgeries that we had talked about as well. So let's talk about aortic aneurysms for a minute. Um, they can be atherosclerotic, uh, and that's that's the most of them, and they they often occur in the descending aorta. They can be post-traumatic. Um, or they can be congenital or syphilitic ascending aortic arches. Um, there can be mycotic aortic aneurysms and arteritis and cystic medial necrosis. And we'll talk about the Marfan's patient, a very common aortic aneurysm uh, repair. So the one that's causing most of the problems are these arterial sclerotic aortic aneurysms, and they are. Uh, the aneurysms arise in areas of dense uh, atherosclerosis. The process erodes into the aortic wall, breaks down the medial elements there in that middle layer. And as the aortic widens, the, the tensions increase and it accelerates the process. And so once, once an aneurysm begins, it's kind of like when you're blowing up a balloon. It's harder, you know, as the balloon becomes bigger, it becomes easier to inflate it. And that's kind of what an aortic aneurysm can do as well. And once an aneurysm is discovered, they have to track it very carefully to see how quickly it may be getting bigger. And so aortic aneurysms at different different sites. Here's the here's in, in the root. Here's the ascending aortic aneurysm. Here's one ascending an arch. This is a descending aneurysm. Uh, and this is a thoracoabdominal aneurysm all the way down across the diaphragm. Now, abdominal aortic aneurysms, isolated, they, there's, uh, they, they can be, uh, they can exist too. Some of the descending aortic aneurysms 
Um, we used to do, use a lot of left heart bypass to to fix those, but today there's uh, some interesting techniques. The uh, the endograft methods where they can do it. Uh, you know, cardiology can do these cases now, and it's really interesting how they have these deployable aortic grafts that they can they can insert from the inside. So they, we don't even have to open the chest. They can do this all under fluoroscopy. Um, so it's a, it's a neat technique uh, to fix a lot of these. Uh, however, the ascending and art, the, the ascending aneurysms and arches, they can uh, pose a different, a different problem. So again, we had mentioned cystic medial necrosis, um, and uh, these are uh, characterized by deposits within the medium media with these little microcysts, and they can coalesce and they can really weaken uh, the wall. And we see this sort of thing in the the Marfan's patient is uh, susceptible to aortic uh, aneurysms because it's a connective tissue disorder, and um, and it's mostly the ascending uh, aorta that they uh, that has these aneurysms in it. Um, the the Marfan's patients are typically tall, very tall uh, in in size. They have very uh, very lax joints. They're super flexible. Uh, because of this connective tissue disorder, um, and they're susceptible to aortic dissections, uh, and they, they they're interesting. They uh, they're but uh, you'll often see those uh, present with fairly significant ascending aortic aneurysms. Syphilitic aortas uh, can be really nasty. Um, often there's AI involved, and it can affect the valve. Um, this uh, and, and these are very difficult repairs just because it's uh, uh, you know it's an infective kind of situation. Aortic aneurysms can uh, become aortic dissections, and that's caused by a tear in the intima, and it allows a column of blood to enter the aortic wall. You know, we, these are naturally occurring dissections. Of course, when we test the arterial cannula, we're trying to prevent an iatrogenic uh, arterial dissection by actually, pre we, we want to avoid pumping blood between the layers. But these can, these can be caused, degenerate, degeneration of the media is a prerequisite. Um, and again, the Marfan's patient can often have not only uh, an aneurysm, but also a dissection. Another big cause of a dissection can be blunt chest uh, trauma and uh, by a deacceleration injury. So you're driving along in your car um, and you hit an immovable object and your body is still moving at the rate of the car. Um, and this, is, uh, this can cause a transection or a dissection of the aorta. And you know, it's it's it, you know many many fatal auto accidents are are due to this, but the the site is kind of interesting. You, you remember this? Uh, there's a patent ductus when in fetal circulation, and that becomes the ligamentum arteriosum, and that is a, a fibrous connection between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And so you have this aorta that's sort of uh, somewhat flexible. Uh, being fixed in position by this ligamentum and, and some of the surrounding structures. And so when, uh, when a deacceleration occurs, that aorta pulls forward and it can, it can dissect or transect even right at the, in this area as it's being held in place. Um, and it can, just, it can just be a tear. And so just to review, I know you've had this, the aortic dissection classification. You should be familiar with the DeBakey and the Shumway Stanford uh, categorization of and classification of these aortic dissections. Um, you'll see the terminology can be different from place to place, uh, but you should understand what each one of these mean. So back to deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. Um, you can use circulatory arrest in and of itself, cool a patient to 18 and just go. Or if there's going to be prolonged periods of circulatory arrest, um, surgeons often consider using either retrograde cerebral perfusion or selective antegrade cerebral perfusion. And we have uh, some cartoons of those right here. Um, for retrograde, 
oxygenated blood is pumped up through the jugular vein, retrograde through the brain, and it returns back to the aortic arch um, in a reverse fashion. For selective anagrade, normal blood flow up one side, up usually a carotid, uh, into the brain and returning back to the, to the aortic arch. So each one of those is, uh, is viable, uh, is, is being used uh, clinically today. To really understand these, we should, we should take a look at the circulation in the head so we understand better what's going on up there. Um, this, this, the, uh, the arterial blood supply to the brain is, is, is quite interesting. Um, blood travels from the heart through the aortic arch and into the carotid and vertebral basilar arterial systems. And these are the arteries that supply blood to the brain. So let's, let's take a closer look at that. Um, again, here's our aortic arch down here. We have a carotid artery. We have another carotid artery. And we have two vertebral arteries, which are branches off our right and left subclavian artery. Um, so these sort of these these blood supplies joins right here in this this area the vertebrals and the carotid blood supply all come together uh, at the circle of Willis and so the circle of Willis is a really interesting structure it's very protective to the brain so here's our vertebral arteries coming in and there's a basilar artery and here's our circle of Willis. Our internal carotid arteries are coming in here, providing blood, um, and we have the blood supply to the brain, the arterial blood supply to the brain. And so we have this little traffic circle called the Circle of Willis, um, which is really handy uh, because if there's interruption of blood flow in any one of those four pipes that are providing arterial blood to the brain, uh, this Circle of Willis can, can distribute blood to all the regions of the brain. There's a lot of ways to remember this, uh, but you should, you should be able to um, remember the primary structures. And here's a view of the circle of Willis uh, in, a, in, a, in a real brain that's been injected with the red latex in the arterial system. And you can see um, the, uh, the vertebral arteries here at the bottom. Here's the basilar artery, and here's the, here's the, Will here's the circle right here. So study this understand the circle of Willis, and, uh, and we'll, we'll discuss that more in class. The venous, the venous blood supply to the brain is also really important. We know we've got these internal and external jugular veins that are, that are draining blood from the head. And if you look at the uh, sort of a cross section, you can see that these, there's some large uh, superior sagittal sinus. There's uh, some of these larger veins that are coalescing to the uh, to the jugular vein and that that of course is heading back down to the right side of the heart and again coming down meeting up there's a left left inanimate vein it's that's draining from uh, from the left side of the left jugular and then the right jugular down here to the uh, superior vena cava Important to understand a little bit about this anatomy. So let's talk about some of the techniques. And, uh, you know, I really want you to study some of these. Uh, so if we're going to use uh, a retrograde cerebral perfusion technique, especially if it's planned, um, it's nice to have, uh, it's nice to have a, you know, a reconfigured circuit so you can easily do it. And this is, you know, I want you to study these diagrams. And we're going to put these diagrams up on the board in class. But... Here we have a, this is a femoral artery, and then we have a venous line going up to a, a Y to an IVC and an SVC cannula. But you can see that the arterial line is actually connected right here, and it's, and in this clamped position, we have traditional bypass. We're pumping into the femoral artery, we're draining from the SVC and the IVC down to the venous reservoir. For retrograde cerebral perfusion, we would stop flow, so we've cooled down to 18. Excuse me. We've cooled down to 18, and uh, we're pumping up 
this clamp has been removed, so we're pump pumping up the IVC cannula, and we're going retrograde through the brain. Um, and meanwhile, uh, we're not providing any systemic circulation. So study these graphs. We're going to talk about them in class. There's a couple of them here. So retrograde cerebral perfusion, um, this was an interesting study, and it was about in, the, it was in 1997, so it's getting dated now, but um, th this, this started uh, sort of the cascade of uh, the idea that maybe retrograde cerebral perfusion is not that great. And what they did, they had 10 pigs, and they um, used either selective anti-grade or retrograde cerebral perfusion. They didn't use blood. They perfused with India ink. Um, and the results were pretty interesting. Uh, the anti-grade group, uh, they saw the brain, venous, the, the arterial and venous systems were completely filled with ink. When they looked at the retrograde, it was much, much less perfused with the India ink. So here's, here's the anti-grade. You can see um, the vasculature is, is marked with this India ink, whereas in the retrograde cerebral perfusion group, it seems a little more superficial. There's not, a, not the depth of uh, of perfusion of the India ink. And here's a, another cross section. You can see how much darker the anti-grade cerebral perfusion was from the retrograde. And some of their conclusions were that retrograde, excuse me, retrograde only provides a limited amount of blood to the brain tissues, which flows mainly through the superficial and large and deep cerebral vessels. And so, uh, and we see that today, um, they're, we're struggling to understand, uh, you know, which technique is the best? Uh, deep hypothermic circuitry arrest alone? Um, or retrograde cerebral perfusion? Or selective anti-grade cerebral perfusion? And uh, this was an interesting paper. It's fairly fairly recent. It's a 2016. And and they they found that, um, you know, they, they said uh, selective cerebral perfusion may be added to prevent neurologic complication. But selective cerebral perfusion in its own right it adds complexity and, and, uh, and some of the complications of selective, selector, selective uh, anti-grade perfusion is embolization, hyper, hyper perfusion, and an increased intracranial tensions. Uh, so it just adds uh, some complexity. And in their hands, they conclude that in spite of the introduction of uh, uh, selective anti-grade cerebral perfusion, simple DHCA without any cerebral perfusion is still safe, expeditious, and reliable um, outcomes. And this is uh, this kind of comes to bear. This is a, a, a quite recent uh, survey um, by the uh, aortic surgery uh, aortic surgeons, and you can see that straight deep hypothermic circuitry arrest all by itself about twenty percent all by itself, or if it's a really complex case, they may add uh, cerebral perfusion depending on the case. So uh, these two together uh, make up a large amount. And then selective anti-grade cerebral perfusion seems to be very popular by 45%. And retrograde cerebral perfusion has really dropped off. And um, I think it is due to the, um, the understanding that it probably does not provide uh, as much oxygenation to the, to the brain as previously thought. Thanks, guys. I'll try to get some quiz questions up for you and look forward to talking about this in class.